Chapter five, when students are in danger, supporting students in the trauma-informed classroom, my classroom community. A week before our school year ended, my class was putting together a book of all the stories, jokes, and learning that had happened that year. One student was writing down her favorite song of the school year, which sparked a conversation with her table mate. I didn't hear the beginning of their conversation, but from the corner of our classroom, I heard one girl make a comment that shook me. Yeah, he beat Rihanna up, but you know it was her fault. She deserved it. They were talking about the tragic incident of the recording artist Chris Brown assaulting his then-girlfriend Rihanna, another famous singer. The incident had been all over the news and had trickled down to the students in my classroom. There wasn't much ambiguity to the facts of the case. Chris Brown was under investigation for felony battery and photos of Rihanna's bruised face had been leaked to the press. It was pretty easy for anyone to connect the dots, but it seemed that some of the young minds in my room had only partially understood the situation. Even more troubling was that some had come to the conclusion that the innocent woman had brought the abuse upon herself. This comment, which my student made so casually, upset me. Had she overheard this statement and was repeating it? Or was this her own conclusion? Perhaps she was led to believe women are at fault more than men because of a larger cultural narrative. Or perhaps she simply was at the point in her life when kids believe bad things only happen to bad people. Either way, I felt it was my responsibility as a teacher and as a caring adult to address her comment. Abuse was an intimidating subject for me to approach as a teacher. I could have ignored her comment or quickly told her not to say something like that, but instead I explored her thoughts further. I asked her, what do you mean? Tell me more about that. She explained that she didn't know much about the case, but had heard her family talking about it. Murmurings and whispers swept through the room and numerous students raised their hands eager to share their personal experiences. I remember the conversation clearly. One student explained how he had used his small body to hold the bathroom door shut in order to protect himself and his little sister from the rage of his mother's ex-boyfriend. Another student shared the story of the time his intoxicated father threw the TV across their room, forcing the child and his mother to flee barefoot in the snow to the safety of a neighbor's apartment. One child told how his father had heroically intervened in a physical fight to protect his family friend. And another explained that the reason her cousins now lived with her family was because they had gotten hit before. Yet another child told me of a bloody handprint left on the wall of their new apartment. I can still see it in my mind, he said. For me, it was shocking to realize this topic elicited such a strong outpouring of emotions and that so many of my students had such personal experiences of abuse. Adverse Childhood Experiences in America Below are a few of the startling statistics that demonstrate the realities of abuse in America. In 2013, 47 states reported approximately 3.1 million children received preventative services from Child Protective Services agencies in the United States. Of the children who experienced maltreatment or abuse, nearly 80% suffered neglect, 18% suffered physical abuse, and 9% suffered sexual abuse. One in 15 children is exposed to intimate partner violence each year, and 90% of these children are eyewitnesses to that violence. About one in 10 children will be sexually abused before they turn 18 years old. Knowing the reality of abuse in America is the first step to becoming a trauma-informed educator. The National Coalition Against Domestic Violence encourages that local schools and youth programs train teachers, school counselors, and athletic coaches on how to recognize children and teens who are victims of intimate partner abuse. Provide educators with resources and prepare them to intervene in domestic violence, dating violence, and stalking situations. But I was almost taken aback by Sonny's story. He told the class something quite shocking. Sonny had just arrived at our school. He had come from a Mexican city on the border. He told the story of his journey to America and the incident that had caused his mother and himself to flee for their lives. He told us all how his father would fight with his mother, but because his father was friends with the president, as he put it in his developing English, his father never got in trouble. Sonny told me of the day he and his mother escaped. He had to run from the door of his house to the car while his father was shooting a gun at his mother. As Sonny told the class his story, his big brown eyes looked up at me and a broad forced smile kept his tears at bay. I marveled 
and how such a little boy had been so strong. Abuse in America. While most of my students have not experienced abuse, the hard truth I learned that afternoon is that some have. Looking at the statistics, I know that some of the students in my classroom are likely experiencing abuse or coping with the fallout every day, but not telling anyone. The statistics on how many of America's children experience abuse show an appalling reality. As teachers, we want to believe the children in our classrooms are the exception that our students are the lucky few who defy the statistics and that this issue is for other people's classrooms, but we are most likely wrong. A study published in JAMA Pediatrics in 2014 found that 5% of American children experienced abuse. That number is based on cases confirmed by Child Protective Services between 2004 and 2011. But the study's researchers made sure to point out that the actual number of children mistreated at some point before the age of 18 was probably much larger. Approximately one in eight children will experience some form of abuse or neglect in their own home. Based on sheer statistics, every teacher is extremely likely to encounter students within their classroom who have likely lived through adverse childhood experiences. We must be prepared to listen and act effectively when that situation arises. The trauma-informed teacher. Teachers can best serve their students when they educate through a trauma-informed lens. According to the Trauma-Informed Care Project, becoming trauma-informed means recognizing that people often have many different types of trauma in their lives. People who have been traumatized need support and understanding from those around them. Loss of safety is a defining characteristic of trauma. When a student does not feel safe, they are unable to access the parts of the brain that control higher level thinking, including the ability to learn. An emphasis on acting as a trauma-informed educator is to minimize the effects of trauma in the learning environment. We can do this by not allowing our words or actions to re-traumatize students and by supporting these students in the classroom. Trauma is an overwhelming event. It takes away our safety, it creates a sense of helplessness, and it continues to affect our perception of reality, explains Dr. James Henry, director of the Children's Trauma Assessment Center. For these students, danger is right around the corner. The brain gets wired to expect danger. Trauma-informed practices are not always intensive individual interventions. Teachers don't need to wait for special permission or district mandates. We can create supports for our entire class. My first step was establishing a safe place, explains Jody Grove, a teacher at Edison Elementary in Walla Walla, Washington. It was simply a space behind my desk where a first grade student could go to de-escalate in a safe manner. By going into the safe place, it signaled to me as the teacher that a particular student needed support, that he or she needed to feel safe and have his or her feelings acknowledged. When a student is able to return to a calm and regulated state, they are usually able to tell me what triggered such a strong reaction. The incident could have been instigated by something as small as not getting the color crayon they wanted. After a short discussion, even the child knows it had nothing to do with the crayon. I have found that six-year-olds are surprisingly capable of identifying the source of their trauma or loss. Because of the safe place, one student was able to tell me he was confused and angry because his dad just left. Another let me know how acutely she feels the absence of her mother who is incarcerated. Before I implemented the safe place, my only recourse was to send students to their seats with their heads down. Now I have seen firsthand students who are in an escalated state go straight to the safe place and use strategies to calm their bodies. I knew that the change was working when one of my students went to music class and asked the teacher where the safe place was in her room. By making a deliberate effort to become a trauma-informed teacher, I have learned that my students need love, so much love, but that they also need an empathetic teacher who can teach them how to self-regulate in a safe manner so they can learn. Feel encouraged that there are probably already a multitude of strategies you are using in your classroom right now that are supportive of students dealing with trauma. For instance, providing predictable rituals and routines, being steady and consistent in your tone, or simply regularly checking in with students you are concerned about are all immensely helpful. A teacher's job is to respond to the varied needs of all students. And we have an ethical imperative to respond to those in crisis with love and to the letter of the law. Trauma and the law. I am a mandatory reporter. 
The Child Welfare Information Gateway offers a wealth of information on mandatory reporting laws. They describe a mandatory reporter as a person required to report suspected child maltreatment to an appropriate agency, such as Child Protective Services, a law enforcement agency, or a state's toll-free child abuse reporting hotline. Requirements for mandatory reporting vary from state to state. Typically, a report must be made when the reporter in his or her official capacity suspects or has reason to believe that a child has been abused or neglected. Another standard frequently used is in situations in which the reporter has knowledge of or observes a child being subjected to conditions that would reasonably result in harm to the child. This means there are many people who are not only empowered to report child abuse and neglect, but also legally required to do so. Exactly who is a mandatory reporter varies by state, but in 48 states, mandatory reporters include teachers, principals, and other school personnel. Safe Horizon, an organization that works to provide support, prevent violence, and promote justice for victims of abuse, states that 17% of all reports of child abuse and neglect are made by teachers. As educators, we are also in the company of medical workers, social workers, law enforcement officers, and medical health professionals as mandatory reporters. Some states also include clergy, athletic staff, and animal control officers as legally required reporters of abuse or neglect. In all, there is a massive network of adults who are mandatory reporters. However, I would like the entire nation to join the 18 states that legally require any person who suspects child abuse or neglect to report their concerns. As a teacher, I know it is my legal responsibility to report child abuse or neglect. I do not see this as a burden, but as a duty to do everything I can to ensure the safety and well-being of the children I am trusted with during the school day. Like almost every teacher I know, I have indeed officially reported my concerns of child abuse. The sad reality is that I have felt the need to make reports every single year I have been teaching. The first few times I was especially anxious to report my concerns about abuse and neglect to state agencies. I felt the weight of responsibility to help the children whom I suspected were suffering abuse I've also felt discouraged and let down when my concerns were not followed up by our state welfare agency. There is no official notification to the implicated party as to who actually reports concerns, yet sometimes the suspected abuser has connected the report back to me. I have been confronted by a parent I implicated in a report. While this particular situation did not turn violent, I have seen a confrontation between a suspected abuser and school personnel turn into a threatening encounter. In this situation, our school followed guidelines provided by our school district's safety and security department. I encourage educators to familiarize themselves with the procedures and resources their school districts offer. Personally, I feel the need to do more than just report my concerns. As a teacher, I feel compelled to advocate for all American children who experience abuse and neglect. I believe we teachers can all be voices for change in our communities. We can speak truth to decision makers about the need for adequate funding and trained personnel to respond to our concerns of abuse. We can speak up for more comprehensive programs that support our students who have been traumatized. We can seek more information about how trauma is affecting our classrooms and demand training to develop our abilities to support students who are suffering. Teachers especially have the power to make a difference on this issue. Know the signs of abuse. Abuse and trauma can manifest differently in different children, sometimes leading to guilt, shame, and confusion. Due to the complex nature of abuse, children do not often make explicit cries for help. The Department of Justice advises, a common presumption is that children will give one detailed, clear account of abuse. This is not consistent with research. Disclosures often unfold gradually and may be presented in a series of hints. Because of this, it is vital that educators are aware of red flags and warning signs so we can respond appropriately. The Mayo Clinic provides an extensive list of symptoms of abuse and neglect, but also cautions us keep in mind that warning signs are just that, warning signs. The presence of warning signs doesn't necessarily mean a child is being abused. The clinic emphasizes that when abuse or neglect is suspected, the concerned party should contact the appropriate agencies or departments. Physical abuse signs and symptoms, unexplained injuries such as bruises, fractures, or burns, injuries that don't match the given explanation, or untreated medical or dental problems. Sexual abuse signs or symptoms, 
sexual behavior or knowledge that is inappropriate for the child's age, pregnancy or a sexually transmitted infection, and statements that he or she was sexually abused, trouble walking or sitting or complaints of genital pain or abuse of other children sexually, emotional abuse signs and symptoms, delayed or inappropriate emotional development, loss of self-confidence or self-esteem, social withdrawal or a loss of interest or enthusiasm, depression, headaches or stomach aches with no medical cause, avoidance of certain situations such as refusing to go to the school or ride the bus, desperately seeking affection, a decrease in school performance or a loss of interest in school, or a loss of previously acquired developmental skills, neglect signs and symptoms, poor growth or weight gain, poor hygiene, a lack of clothing and supplies to meet physical needs, taking food or money without permission, eating a lot in one sitting or hiding food for later, a poor record of school attendance, a lack of appropriate attention for medical, dental, or psychological problems, or a lack of necessary follow-up care, emotional swings that are inappropriate or out of context to, to the situation, or indifference. Teacher tools. Identify your allies. While many of my students will never struggle with abuse, self-harm, or emotional challenges, I know some will, yet it's impossible to predict exactly which students these will be. I have often had meetings about these topics with my whole class, casting a wide net and hoping to catch the students who need catching. Inspired by Signs of Suicide, an evidence-based suicide prevention intervention program aimed at adolescents, one purpose of these conversations is to have students identify exactly which people in their lives could be allies in a difficult situation. The term ally is so appropriate. Teacher does not fully encompass our role in students' lives. What then, friend? Certainly we should be friendly to our students, but teachers who put themselves in the position of a friend do a disservice to their role in their students' lives. Wendy O. Osefo, professor and graduate director at Goucher College says this, allyship is a much deeper bond and relationship than just the average teacher to student. As an ally, you not only provide guidance to the student, but you also provide a voice for the student. With allyship, teachers both empower and support students. Most importantly, students feel as though they have a partner in the educational process. This relationship is also a benefit to teachers. Students are more keen to listen and take risks as learners due to the underlying trust and relationship the allyship has created. Furthermore, in times of hardship, a teacher will act as an ally by walking through all the steps with the student, from reporting the incident to recovery. As an ally, a teacher will not simply hand the student off to the counselor, but rather walk them through the entire process while providing both an ear and shoulder if needed. As allies, the image of walking through a time of hardship with our students is powerful. Just having someone to walk beside them can change realities for a student. Numerous studies have shown the benefits allies and mentors can have. A study from Brigham Young University found that for all teen students, having an adult mentor meant a 50% greater likelihood of attending college. For disadvantaged students, mentorship by a teacher nearly doubled the odds of attending college. Whatever the challenge may be, whether it is overwhelming or just the expected struggle of growing up, students need to know there are people who can support them. Some students might already know exactly who to turn to when they need help because they have a close-knit support system, but others will need help identifying their allies. In particular, students who have encountered abuse are going to be especially unclear about whom they can turn to, since often the abuse has occurred at the hands of a trusted adult. Start the conversation by discussing what an ally is. Talk about where students have heard this term before, or have them look up its definition. Then discuss what it means to have an ally and why allies are important. Help students identify allies they have in their lives. They might initially think of peers, their friends, or siblings, which is common. Ultimately, you want students to identify adults in, as their allies as well. If a student goes to another child with a significant problem, the child might not have the ability to help, or it might be too much for them to handle. It is okay to tell children this. Then lead students in a brainstorming in which adults are their allies both in school and outside the school. Have them write down their list of allies. Simply writing down names can make it official in their eyes. You may have students who claim they don't have a single ally, and that is fine. This activity is made for them. When this happens, I write my name on the board. 
The next step is very important. Explicitly state to your students that you are their ally. So many times we teachers think this is implied and that their students know they can come to us. Still, make sure you can say aloud, I am your ally, you can trust me. Students can carry out this list with them, but by simply having them identify and document their allies, you are giving students the first step in reaching out for help when they need it. Number two, promises we can keep. Sophia's story speaks volumes about the impact our words can have on children when they are in the middle of a crisis. It is so tempting to reassure students and tell them everything will be okay. But that is simply not something we can guarantee. However, there is plenty we can say to children that is both reassuring and true. I encourage teachers to think about true statements they can make to students and have them at the ready. Promises teachers cannot keep. This won't ever happen to you again. I can fix this. You don't have to worry anymore. I won't let you down. It will be okay. Promises teachers can keep. There are a lot of people who want to help you and I will always care about you. I am here to help you. It is my job. This is not your fault. What has happened to you is not fair and I am sorry you have to deal with this. You don't have to cope with this alone. It sounds like there are some really hard things going on that you wish you could stop. Number three, regulation activities. Students who have been exposed to adverse childhood experiences may react differently than others in your classroom. Even long after a traumatic event, children can re-experience fear and terror when sensory input reminds their brain of the previous trauma. For example, a door being slammed, the lights shutting off, or an unexpected touch may seem normal to those of us who have not experienced trauma, but can trigger an intense reaction from children who have. Trauma exposure can cause a student to enter a hypervigilant state in which their body is responding as if there is still an active threat. When a student is in this heightened state, talking usually doesn't help because they aren't able to think logically. Resist the urge to lecture a student or offer advice. Instead, teachers can respond by offering regulation activities. It is a good idea for the child to practice completing regulation activities before he or she is in a hyper-attentive, agitated state, so they will know how to do the activity when they need it. A powerful way to teach self-regulation is simply to model it. The act of teaching can be arduous and frustrating, which presents a great opportunity for teachers to model the self-regulation skills we want to develop in our students. While I am a teacher, I also happen to be a real person who gets frustrated and irritated when I am interrupted. There was a time when my class had not yet developed the self-control to not shout out their thoughts. I kept track of how many times I had to stop and redirect the class. It was 42 times while reading just 12 pages of a picture book. That's almost once a sentence. I was at my limit and felt overwhelmed and frustrated. So I stopped reading the book and did a breathing exercise. I often stop my class to calm myself and other times to refocus my students. I might do this three to 10 times a day. Really, I say, I am frustrated and in order to teach you, I need to be calm. So I am going to breathe slowly. This signals to the kids that there needs to be a change in behavior that gives them a living example of how to do it for themselves. Regulation activities for the whole class, music. Research shows that classical music can help calm students. Upbeat pop music has a similar effect if used thoughtfully. Many popular artist songs express positive themes such as gratitude, self-appreciation, and kindness. Janissa Malasani, a fifth grade teacher at my school, uses a new popular song each week to practice fluency, learn figurative language, and discuss how each song's themes relate to her students' lives. By the end of the week, many of my students are singing the song and dancing in their chairs. It's so great to see the classroom grounded in positivity and joy while teaching necessary skills. Breathing activities. Slow and meditative breathing can help a student regain a sense of calm. Former third grade teacher Susanna Moaning introduced the Cortices breathing practice in our school. As a class, we take about 45 seconds after lunch to breathe slowly as we lightly tap our head and heart. There are so many breathing activities that can be used in a classroom 
find one that works for your students. Positive self-talk. Having a mantra or a class chant can help establish a culture of self-regulation. This can be as simple as, I know I can be calm. When I worked in DC public schools, all the students at Stanton Elementary stated, what my mind can conceive, my heart can believe, and I can achieve each morning during the announcements. Regulation activities for individual students. Bounce back boxes. Offer a small box with calming activities tailored to a specific student's interests. The box may contain clay, stuffed animals, or coloring materials. For older students, this might be headphones for listening to music or even handheld electronics. For some students, I include an egg timer so they can monitor how much time it takes them to bounce back. Remember, it may take more time than you think for a student to regain a calm state of mind. Safe place. As in Jody Grove's classroom, a safe place should be established beforehand. Students need to know where to go, what will happen there, and that they will not be in danger. These spots can be established in individual classrooms or can be a single space available to the whole school. Video games. Yes, video games. Once, a child in my classroom had an intense reaction to his father being deported. This caused him to enter a dysfunctional state several times a day. One day, he even attempted to jump out of a second-story window. While our school worked to support him through this time, we found that allowing him to play a simple race car game on a computer brought him to a calmer, more rational state of mind where he could feel safe and be helped. When a child is in an agitated state, a simple video game can be a perfect way to have them shift their focus from a trauma-triggered, hyper-vigilant state to a calming activity. Simple games like Pac-Man or Tetris are engaging, but don't demand a ton of cognition or attention. Number four, take care of thyself. If there were commandments for teaching, the very first etched in stone would be take care of thyself. Oh, what a difficult commandment that is to follow. I still struggle with it. Most of my evaluation and feedback conversations end with my caring principal urging me to Take more time for yourself. We don't want you to burn out. If we are going to help our students through challenging times, we must make sure we are working to resolve our own issues as well. We all have experiences and feelings we need to work through, confidences we need to build, stresses we need to release, and interpersonal conflicts we need to manage. Dealing with what our students share with us has an effect on us. A while back, a fellow Denver teacher asked me how I deal with the difficult realities I learn about my students' lives. How do I manage knowing about tragedies and traumas children should never have to experience? He said his high school students completed an exercise similar to I Wish My Teacher Knew. He helped his students compose personal memoirs that told stories of significant moments in their lives. From this one assignment, four of his students were brave enough to convince they have been sexually assaulted. As teachers, we wonder if we can possibly support our students through the challenges and problems. How can we even bear to hear about all the heartache in our classrooms? I confess I do not have a complete answer to this. I too feel overwhelmed at times by knowing some of the realities my students face. I go back to a wonderful educator who was my mentor teacher, Rachel Bernard. She told me, I get the courage to listen and be supportive during the most traumatizing events in my students' lives from the children themselves. If a child is courageous enough to open up to me about what they have experienced, I can be brave enough to listen. My strength comes from their strength. My hope comes from their hope. In the end, I would always rather allow a student to feel heard, even when it hurts to listen. We can and should take comfort in the fact that by working through our own doubts, insecurities, and traumas, we are helping our students do the same for themselves. And we are creating a safe and secure environment in our classrooms. What would this actually mean? Certainly, teachers need to take responsibility for maintaining their own mental health. But there is also an opportunity for us as educators to create understanding cultures in our schools that are supportive of teachers dealing with some of the same struggles and challenges we want to support our students through. We can push our school districts and local governments to provide our educational professionals with the programs and policies that support their mental and emotional health. 
It's also important to remember that we can find support from fellow teachers, commiserating and celebrating with others who know the unique realities and responsibilities of our jobs. It may seem counterintuitive that in order to take care of our students, we must first take care of ourselves. And there, there is always so much to be done for our students each day. At least for myself, it is hard to justify taking time, even outside of the school day, to focus on my needs. Yet teachers need to have the emotional and mental space to truly teach and help their students. The verb in teacher is teach. If we want to do this, we must meet our students where they are. Some might say that educators should leave the work of supporting students through trauma to others. But the truth is that teachers are at the front lines of child abuse and endangerment. We are truly the first responders. We see students every day and are in a position of trust. In some cases, a teacher is the only adult an abused child trusts. To a child in your classroom, you might be the only adult they have a relationship with who is safe and stable. In fact, according to the Department of Justice of all professionals, teachers are the most likely to be told by a child about abusive situations. Tell me something terrible. In sharing my students' words, I have been asked if the I wish my teacher knew lesson goes too far. Some worry that it might get too personal and might blur the imaginary line between school and home. People wonder, what if you find out something you don't want to know? What if you find out something terrible? The truth is, I want to find out something terrible. My greatest fear as a teacher is that a child will feel forced to hold a painful secret, a secret that if not released could mean they live in fear or harbor a sense of deep shame, that they would be condemned to bear this secret alone. I worry that a child might be going through something I could help with, some trauma that could be addressed if only I knew about it. The I wish my teacher knew lesson is an invitation for these secrets to be released if a student is ready. Children are given permission to open up about whatever they feel is most important. If that means they are brave enough to tell me about a trauma, however terrible, I welcome it. A fellow educator recommended to many teachers at her school that they try the I wish my teacher knew lesson. She told me that of the hundreds of students who completed the activity, about 10 children gave answers that were truly cries for help. In one instance, a teenage girl opened up about being sexually abused. When given the opportunity to ask for help, she was brave enough to do so. She is now protected from her abuser and is being given the help she needs to heal. We want to know kids in all their facets, all their experiences, wonderful and terrible. We teachers want to know the terrible, the heartbreaking, the painful. We do not run away from scary or complicated situations. We run toward them as first responders do. We can only support our students in overcoming these difficult situations if we are aware of them. I am an educator. I am not a social worker or a therapist. I do not have expertise in trauma or abuse. Since that is the case, I know my boundaries. Part of developing my practice as an educator is understanding when and how I serve students within my own skill set and abilities. If an issue a student brings me is not within my ability to support, I seek resources and the expertise of others. However, as a third grade teacher, it is always within my capabilities to care for and listen to the voices of the children in my classroom. I choose to be an ally for my students even during times of hardship. By striving to create a trauma-informed classroom environment, I know I can ameliorate the effects of abuse and trauma, which I see as both moral and legal imperatives. Teachers are truly on the front lines. We act as first responders to identify and report concerns, as well as provide healing to students simply by listening understanding, and to empathizing. As teachers, the relationships we build with students matter. Every day in their very own classrooms, our students deserve to have access to an adult who is genuine, consistent, and reliable. We can buffer trauma and prove to students there are adults who can be trusted so that we can support rigorous learning in our classrooms.